So what we're going to do now is we're going to wrap up our discussion of the bridge pattern. And as is our tradition, we're going to talk about other considerations. We're going to talk about pros and cons and implementation considerations and known uses and so on. One of the good things about this pattern is it very distinctly decouples the abstraction from the implementer hierarchy. And that allows these two to evolve separately by applying something called the open-closed principle. Uh, the open-closed principle is a very, very famous principle that you can read about down here. I think it was actually dis uh, first described using that name by a famous computer scientist named uh, Bertrand Meyer. I'm not pronouncing his name with the correct French accent, but uh, he, he doesn't mind if we just call him Bertrand Meyer. And uh, he had a wonderful book that came out a really long time ago, like early to mid 80s, that talked about object-oriented design and object-oriented programming. And he talks about the open-closed principle. And the idea behind the open-closed principle is you want to keep the interface closed. In other words, you want to be able to rely on the interface being fixed, but you want to be able to make it possible to extend the behavior of the class. And so you define a fixed interface, but then you allow some implementation to be varied through inheritance and dynamic binding. And so the bridge pattern is just the canonical or a canonical way of doing the open-closed principle because you have an abstraction with a fixed API, but then you can refine that abstraction by inheriting from it. And then you can also inherit from the implementer uh, hierarchy as well and refine that. So we can refine it in a couple different dimensions while keeping the API the same. By the way, there's a famous set of uh, principles known as the solid principles for object-oriented design. And uh, these, were, these were basically popularized by a great guy, great computer science and programmer named Robert Martin, Uncle Bob as he's called. And he's contributed enormous numbers of things to the object-oriented design and programming community for decades. And so you might take a look at solid and the O in solid is the open-close principle. What is so cool about this is that you can add capability without breaking client code. And that's exactly what the bridge pattern does. Another nice thing about this pattern is you can vary the implementations at design time or even at runtime. In other words, you can decide whether to use one implementation versus another. And you can do that very late in a design cycle. For example, when an object is created, you can go ahead and give it the implementation at that point. Uh, you could also make changes at runtime, but that gets a bit beyond the scope of the bridge pattern. We'll talk about some other patterns later that can help you with that. Naturally, not everything is unicorns and rainbows. So one of the downsides with the bridge is that you end up with a, a one-size-fits-all abstraction interface. And to some extent, also a one-size-fits-all implementer interface, although we'll see there's some ways to, to adapt that to make it more flexible. Why, why is that a problem? Because uh, as you'll discover, as you go through your life as a professional in this field, sometimes what you think is fixed or stable at first ends up changing over time as you get more information. And that is a source of never-ending challenges in software design, because if you realize that your original interface is inadequate, then you have to make some changes. And one of the downsides with Bridge is you're kind of locked into the interface that you came up with, the API you came up with for the abstraction, unless you want to break a lot of client code, which to some extent defeats the whole purpose of this, this uh, pattern. So the, the reference that we use is from Greek mythology, and it's called Procrustean Bed. You don't want to force people into the Procrustean Bed. And I'll, uh, I'll point you to the, the Wikipedia page down here for more information about Procrustus. It's a very famous myth where Procrustus was an innkeeper who would give people a free lodging, but you had to fit in his bed. And if you were too big, he would chop off parts of your body to make you fit. And if you were too short, he would stretch you until you fit. So uh, that, that's used as a metaphor to indicate something that's probably not really what you want. You don't want to be chopped up or stretched unnecessarily. Now, how do you deal with this issue in practice? There's several ways. One way is to apply some other patterns. In fact, that's almost always the way out when when one pattern doesn't get you what you want, the solution is not to give up on patterns. The solution is most often to apply other patterns to solve the problem. So one pattern you can apply, which we've 
talked about briefly before, and I'll touch on here again, is the adapter pattern. So the adapter pattern is designed to make, make it possible to let things work together that weren't designed to work together initially. And uh, the great example of this, of course, is the plug that you're, the plug adapter that you would take with you if you're traveling overseas. Um, we are not probably traveling overseas much at the moment, but if you, if slash when we get back on uh, airplanes and go to other countries, you'll quickly discover that there's lots of different plug form factors around the world. The Australians have a different thing than the people in the UK, which is different from people in Europe, which is different from people in the US and probably other places as well that maybe I haven't been to yet. Um, but the bottom line is you can buy these adapters and they let everything work together so you don't have to buy a, a separate laptop <laughs> or a separate smartphone for every country you travel to. Instead, you just get an adapter. Another pattern that can be used to help make bridge more flexible is something called the strategy pattern. We'll talk more about strategy here shortly, probably tomorrow. And strategy lets you be able to do more dynamic plugging and playing of capabilities. So it's a very important pattern. You'll notice it looks very similar to bridge. And when we talk about strategy in, in all of its full-blown glory, I'll give you a chance to, to see how they compare and contrast with each other. Yet another pattern that's worth knowing about is something that's called the extension interface pattern. And this is actually deliberately taking the issue of one-size-fits-all interfaces head-on. And it makes it possible to be able to define new interfaces and then have a protocol on the client side for negotiating which interface you actually want to use. So rather than trying to make everything fit within the Procrustean bed of a single unchanging interface, extension interface attempts to make it possible to modify interfaces, but do it in a very stylized way. And uh, this is something that was popularized back in the mid 90s, mid to late 90s by a technology called Calm, component object model from Microsoft. I won't talk much more about extension interface right now, but be aware it exists. And there are circumstances where it can be very helpful to allow you to have controlled breaking of interfaces while by having the client code become smart enough to know how to negotiate which interface it actually wants. There's a number of implementation considerations associated with this pattern. Um, one obvious question is how do you make the right abstraction? How do you make the right implementer hierarchy instance? And of course, the answer to those kinds of questions inevitably in patterndom is to apply creational patterns like factory method or builder or abstract factory. And when we talk about the builder pattern later, you'll see how you can use the builder pattern to build up the elements in our composite hierarchy one chunk at a time based on whatever type of node is being uh, parsed and processed by the other parts of the creational pattern. In this case, it's the interpreter and the builder patterns working together as a pattern compound. Um, so without getting too far ahead of ourselves, just be aware that the way you create these things is typically by applying creational patterns. Some other things to think about is how do you share implementers and how do you reference count them? And as we saw with the example in the implementation part, you can use various features like shared pointer or the ref counter example that I used. Um, I, I actually had written this code before shared pointer really existed, so I haven't had a chance to go back and retrofit it to use shared pointer. But um, that would be another way of being able to handle the issues that we talked about of trying to make sure you can control the life cycle of the objects that are referenced by the expression tree, the implementer hierarchy, in other words. And the basic idea is that you keep a reference count of the number of times a shared object is copied by being passed by value using the words in, in air quotes because it's not really copying anything, it's just incrementing and decrementing the reference counts. And you connect those to the constructors and destructors to manage the way things work under the hood. And the idea is when the reference count drops to zero, then the object automatically deletes itself, as we saw in the implementation discussion. Now, if you have certain situations where you need to have um, various behaviors encapsulated around some core implementation, you might want, and, and those things have to vary at runtime, you may want to switch your attention from using the bridge pattern, which is kind of a structural pattern that, that really expects to have kind of one implementation that can be changed, but, but not apply multiple things to, to modify an implementation. 
you might want to consider using something called the decorator pattern. And uh, you can, it's another gang of four pattern, of course, and you can see this link below has more information on decorator. And in that particular case, you can use decorator to enable client specified embellishment, that's the fancy term, of some core object, like the implementer hierarchy, for example, by wrapping it recursively, possibly more than once, and doing this dynamically at runtime. And so the idea here is that you're going to put decorators around some core object, and then when someone makes a method call, then each of those decorators gets a chance to be run before the core object is actually accessed. And uh, the, the classic example of decorator that people talk about whenever they want to give a good, familiar, known use is Java's I.O. model. And if you take a look here, you can see that in Java I.O.'s model, uh, they have this underlying thing called an input stream. And then you can decorate the input stream to make it a file input stream or a string buffer input stream or a byte array input stream or a filter input stream. And then from that, you can decorate it further to make a buffered input stream or a line numbering input stream or a pushback input stream and so on and so forth. And so the basic idea here is that you, uh, the way it works under the hood is they decorate the underlying IO object with these embellishments. And then when operations get called, each piece has a chance to do its thing and it, it embellishes what is being provided as the outside capability that's seen by the person making the call. So if you take a look at the link at the bottom of the page, you can find out about the use of decorator in Java's IO uh, framework. There are lots and lots and lots and lots of known uses of bridge. Uh, very, very heavily used in C++ because of the whole issue of memory management and the fact that you don't have automated garbage collection in C++. Um, we use it extensively in the software I've written called ACE, There's something called the ACE reactor framework, which uses the bridge pattern to be able to have a common interface that then delegates down to operating specific demultiplexing mechanisms, things like select and wait for multiple objects and thread pool reactor and all this good stuff. Um, so bridge is very commonly used in C++. Um, whoops, that should say bridge is used more in C++ than in Java. <laughs> uh, Java. Java, of course, tends to use interfaces, which is a language feature in Java. It's kind of like an abstract class in a way and factories. So that's the more common way of doing things in Java. However, Java also does use the bridge pattern. There's a use of it in the Java uh, windowing toolkit, AWT. There's a really interesting use of the bridge pattern in Java's socket class. So socket is a textbook example of the bridge pattern applied to Java. And you can see that you have a socket, which is used as an endpoint of communication in, uh, in Java and other other languages and technologies as well. But in Java, you have a socket class, and the socket class uses the bridge pattern to delegate to whatever underlying operating system implementation of sockets is needed. On Windows, you'll use the Windows socket implementation. On Unix, you'll use the Unix socket implementation, and so on. And then there's also actually derivation of the abstraction of the socket API itself to make different kinds of services so we can have an SSL socket that uses encryption. We can have a compression socket that compresses the data. So this is, again, just a textbook example of using Bridge in the context of Java. Yet other examples of Bridge in Java would be Java's synchronizers, Rantrit lock, semaphore, and so on, Rantrit read-write lock. And in that case, you have the synchronizer class, say Rantrit lock, and then they use the Bridge pattern to delegate to one of two implementations, which are either fair synchronizers that store up waiters in FIFO order to make it fair, or non-fair synchronizers, which don't necessarily keep track of the FIFO ordering of waiters. And so they tend to be more efficient, but tend to be less fair. So they're not fair, but they're efficient. Fair synchronizer is fair, but less efficient. Uh, it's beyond the scope of this class to go into that distinction in detail, but uh, if you take a look at this link at the bottom, you can learn more about it. And if you come back and take my concurrent object-oriented programming class at some point, I'll go into this in great detail. And what's fun about that is, of course, that class is really talking about concurrency and synchronization, but naturally we discuss the patterns that are used in technologies like the Java platform in order to make the implementations much more 
concise and extensible and reusable and intuitive and so on and so forth. So it's a great example of how all these patterns we're covering here have really been applied in, in everyday life, in real world, highly popular platforms and frameworks. So to summarize the bridge pattern, it decouples the expression tree programming API from its behavior and its implementation in order to make it possible to extend the capabilities transparently. And what we mean by that is we don't break client code when we make these changes. And uh, actually this combination of bridge with composite, so we use the bridge to encapsulate composite, that's actually something that's known as a pattern compound. And we'll talk later about pattern compounds. They're, they're really cool and there are lots of examples of them. And a pattern compound exists when two patterns occur together frequently enough that we start to refer to them as a, say, a bridge composite or a batch iterator. And we'll see some other examples here shortly. Uh, these are examples of what are known as, as the uh, relationships between patterns. And that'll be a topic we'll cover if we have time at the end of the course.